Well, welcome back, everybody, to uh, the last lecture, 162. This is kind of a, a uh, special lecture. Um, I did get some requests for more information about distributed storage and quantum computing. And so I think we're going to do that. And I want to make sure that we talk through the chord algorithm, since that's a, um, I think, relatively simple thing to understand and is uh, very cool and applied pretty much everywhere. So um, if you remember, one of the things we talked about uh, last week was basically this cap theorem, which was really a conjecture that uh, Eric Brewer put forth back in the early 2000s. And it basically said that you could get consistency availability or partition tolerance. You couldn't get them all three at once. You might be able to get two of them at once. And so um, that's the so-called theorem. And uh, we've talked through a number of reasons why that might be true. But um, certainly, <laughs> you can imagine that if you have to be tolerant to cutting the network in half, then it's going to be very hard to uh, be both consistent and available all the time. All right. So oftentimes, the cap theorem is a good way to understand global storage systems as a result. Now, um, at the very end of uh, last lecture, we were talking about key value stores. And uh, the cool thing about key value stores is they're very simple in interface. Excuse me. So basically, uh, you can have an arbitrary key, although that's usually a hash over some value. Um, and you can uh, have a value associated with it. And if you do put uh, key comma value, that goes somewhere into the ether. And then when you do get of the key, you get back the, the value that you started with. And so this interface is extremely simple. It's certainly an interface uh, many of you have used in languages uh, on a single machine. What's interesting is if you use this in a uh, global storage system, it turns out that the interface is simple enough that you can have some pretty interesting um, implementations. Okay, And <clears throat> if you remember, we started talking about key value stores with this notion of a distributed hash table, where what I've got in yellow here is really the key value um, table that we might think about on one node, except that in reality, what happens is this gets distributed over a whole bunch of nodes. And so the question is really uh, many parts to this question. One is, how do we actually do that distributing? Another is, uh, when some client does a get, how does it figure out which node to go through? Clearly, we don't want to have a single routing table in the middle of the network. That's going to be really expensive. Um, and then, uh, you know, what happens if one of these storage nodes fails? OK, and so there's many failure modes you can imagine. There's performance problems and uh, scalability issues where we would like to increase the size of the system by just sort of adding more nodes down at the bottom here. And um, so far, we haven't really talked about how to even make that work. OK, and so today I want to tell you about the Cord uh, algorithm, which uh, has been turned into um, storage systems of many sorts, including those used by Amazon, et cetera, OK, Facebook. So. Um, before we get there, I wanted to remind you of this notion of recursive versus iterative lookups. So um, here's a, an example of a recursive lookup, which is like routing. So what we're doing, so R recursive, R routing. So um, basically, if I say I want to get uh, whatever key 14 has got, it goes to the master directory. And then that directory forwards it on, it routes it to the particular node that's got the results. And then the, uh, the node returns to the directory, which returns back to the original client. That's recursively routing its way through. An iterative uh, approach is one in which the client basically talks to the directory, then they talk to the individual nodes. And um, we're not routing queries through anywhere. Every individual client is um, doing that particular lookup. Okay, And you can imagine that this second example here might be more scalable because we can have many clients all driving the lookups. Um, it gets a little tricky to maintain consistency, though. And so that's one of the reasons we might want to have recursive. Another is that this is just faster, because we're basically just routing the shortest path to the result and back, uh, whereas this iterative one potentially um, is twice, uh, the, twice the latency, OK, if you think about this randomly. So let's see, keep those two implementation technologies in mind. They're really interchangeable um, and are more about what you do with the control plane portion of this than anything else. So um, the challenge of that central directory is really 
that it's got many entries that are sort of key value pairs or at least uh, key node mappings. And you could have billions of entries in the system. And so um, I would say that anything that thinks of a directory here like a single server is bound to be a bad idea, okay? Because it's just not gonna scale to billions of entries very well. All right. And back in the early 2000s, uh, myself and a bunch of other researchers started looking at how do you deal with peer-to-peer -peer technologies as a way to solve this problem. And um, the solution, uh, one solution here is consistent hashing, which I'm gonna tell you about. Um, we did tell you about it last time, but I wanna uh, reemphasize what it is. And the idea behind consistent hashing is it's a way to take your keys and figure out a clean way to distribute them throughout the system without having to know um, pretty much all of the nodes that are participating. So this seems like a, a strong ask when you think about it. If you look back at this diagram for a moment, if there's hundreds or thousands or millions of servers down here and we have to somehow um, consistent with consistent hashing figure out uh, which node to go to without going through a master directory and such that all these nodes don't know about each other, that seems like it's pretty difficult. And um, that's one of the reasons the Cord algorithm is so interesting, all right? Um, and so this is basically gonna be a mechanism to divide our space up and we'll talk you through that uh, in the next slide. And then I'm gonna show you how the Cord algorithm lets you get by with only um, knowing essentially a logarithmic number of nodes in the total system, and you can still do this well. So we're gonna associate, each one of those storage nodes is gonna get a unique ID, okay? And that unique ID is gonna be in the hash space. So imagine you take their, uh, I don't know, their IP address and their owner and whatever, you concatenate all those things together and you hash them and you get a single 256 bit ID out of that. Now we're gonna talk more about secure hashes uh, a little bit later in the lecture, but um, so every node has an ID and it's gonna be in this uh, ring space, this unidimensional space from zero uh, to two to the M minus one where M is gonna be big, okay? And so let me just show you the picture here. So here's an example of the ring, uh, the ring to rule them all. And for the sake of class, I'm only going to talk about m equals 6, okay? So really, there's only 64 possible spots on this ring, 2 to the 64, 2 to the 6, I mean, it gives you 64. In reality, m is probably uh, 256, okay? Because we're using SHA-256 to do our hashing. And so uh, let's just say there's a lot more slots on here than 64. But let's use that for our illustration here. And first of all, notice on this ring are a set of servers that are, uh, they have their ID that's been acquired by hashing their IP address and their name or whatever. So this node here has an ID of four, and that means that we think of it as in position four on the ring. Um, this one has an ID of eight, we think of it as position eight. This one has an ID of 32, we think of it as position 32. Now, um, hopefully what you can see here is these are not evenly distributed. In fact, the probabilistically, they're evenly distributed, but they're really a, a random hash over, um, over some data that's associated with a node. And so they're, they're distributed through the ring, but they're not equally distributed, okay? And it's gonna be important, um, in fact, that we have a good security hash here, uh, a um, secure hash that can basically pick these positions uh, in a way that's uh, hard for anybody to fake, okay? Um, and then, once we've put these on the ring, now what we're gonna say is uh, take for instance, node eight. We're gonna say that node eight stores all hashes uh, with keys from five, which is just after four to eight. And 15 is gonna store everything from nine to 15. And 20 is gonna store everything from 16 to 20. So um, the way to think about this is we put a bunch of storage nodes on this ring and then um, we're gonna decide where to store our key value pairs based on where the key is on this ring, okay? Now, there's a lot of stuff I haven't told you yet. Like for instance, what does this mean physically? Well, I haven't told you physically because since these are randomly hashed, um, these nodes are gonna be spread physically all over the planet potentially. Um, the other thing I haven't told you about is how much do each of these nodes need to know about each other, okay? Now, um, 
So just to emphasize here, so key 14, value 14, is going to be stored on this server. And why is that? Because server 15 is the uh, closest one that uh, whose own hash or own ID is, is bigger or equal to the thing we're storing. Okay. Now I want to pause uh, here and see if there are any questions. And like I said, in practice, M is really something more like 256. And so uh, this ring is really big. And um, these uh, nodes are much more sparsely distributed around the ring. OK, questions? We only have a very small class today, so you guys are likely to get your questions answered. Anybody? OK. No questions. All right. Should we move on? Now. CORD is a system that was developed uh, with a group of researchers at MIT and at Berkeley. Um, and it, you can think of it as a distributed lookup service. Uh, and it's, uh, in my view, I like to teach about it because it's the simplest and cleanest algorithm for distributed storage that I have seen. Um, and it's a comparison point for all sorts of other uh, algorithms, OK? And the uh, important aspect of the design space for CORD is we want to de decouple correctness from efficiency. So we want to figure out what do we need about that ring and the storage servers on that ring so that this, the uh, algorithm I'm going to describe to you is correct. And then we'll talk about how do we make it efficient. Okay. And the thing that's interesting about CORD is we're going to combine that central directory and the storage nodes together and spread them all amongst all the nodes. And so we no longer have a single lookup directory and a set of storage servers. Instead, we're going to have a set of storage servers that are just going to talk to each other to make this work. And the properties uh, are as follows. So correctness, we're going to make sure that each node knows about neighbors on the ring. So it needs to know how to go forward and how to go backwards, a predecessor and a successor on the ring. And as long as the ring is connected, the ring is going to uh, perform its tasks correctly. And then from a performance standpoint, then we're going to start adding some more neighbors. And so we're going to start learning about a logarithmic number of neighbors uh, across the ring. And that's going to help us get uh, a much more efficient lookup. OK? Now, there are many other structured peer-to-peer -peer lookup services like this. Um, Tap Tapestry is one that I worked on here at Berkeley. Bamboo is another one I worked on. There's Pastry, that was a Microsoft uh, product. There's Kademlia. There's a lot of interesting ones, several designs here at Berkeley. Um, and so this problem of how to look up a key value pair got a lot of study in the early 2000s. Okay? And let's look about the way to think about Cord's lookup mechanism is once again routing. So it's going to be, we're going to describe this in a recursive fashion to start with. And then, of course, you can do this uh, in, a, in an iterative way as well. I, I think the recursive version is a lot easier to think about. So every node in the system is going to know who its successor node is. And so here we have an example where some client talks to node four and says, here, look up key 37 for me. OK, and so what's going to happen? Well, we're going to start routing packets from the point at which we enter until we find the right, until we find information about what the right node is that's going to store 37. And we can figure that out if you look uh, ahead, which we can't do if we're a distributed algorithm because we don't know about all these nodes. But we're looking down from above, and you can clearly see that node or look up for a key 37 is going to want to get back node 44 because that's what's going to store uh, key 37. Why is that? Well, 37 is going to get stored on the node that is the closest one clockwise uh, on the ring. Okay, and so 37, the closest one clockwise is 44. So how does this happen? Well. Four says, well, I don't know what it is, so it routes to eight. And he says, I don't know what it is, routes to 15, routes to 20, 32, 35. At this point, 35 knows that its uh, successor is 44, and so it just responds back and says, hey, I happen to know that node 44 is responsible for key 37. And at that point, uh, node four can talk back to the client, and the client now knows just to talk to 44. Okay, now. If we wanted to be fully recursive, we could have 35 pass a query onto 44 and have 44 send the key back. That would be another option. Okay. So if you notice here, in order to make this correct, 
So how did we find the first one again? That's a great question. So the answer is that any clients that talk to the storage server need to know at least one node in the system. Okay, so that one node they need to know uh, doesn't matter which one it is. In this case, the client, which I haven't shown separately out here, happened to know about node four and node four serves as a gateway into the ring. All right, did that answer that question? Now, you can see that this doesn't seem very ideal because if I've got a thousand nodes that are storage nodes, I may have to take many hops to find out uh, what I want here. Um, it turns out that the worst case lookup here is order n, so that's probably bad. Um, but we're going to show you how to get log n in a little bit. Um, it's going to be a dynamic performance optimization and so on that's going to be pretty interesting. Now, what I want you to see, though, is from a correctness standpoint, as long as every node knows who its predecessor is and successor, and, and in this case, just its successor, then we can always find the server we're looking for. Okay. Now, um, what does this really mean? Okay, so here's this ring, and here's you know key 14 stored on node 15. Let's say what it really means is something more like this, right? So these nodes, since we we're doing hashes over their IP addresses and some metadata, it means that um, they could be anywhere in the world, and then we're connecting them together based on their hash names. So four talks to eight, eight talks to 15, and so on. So that, um, for instance, key uh, 14 happens to be stored here on the East Coast. Node four is up in Alaska. So um, based on what you see here, that uh, what I just showed you um, on the previous slide, if somebody were to uh, ask node four for key 14, we would go from Alaska over to the East Coast, over to the West Coast, and we'd get the result, okay? So um, really, because of the hash being a randomizing function, uh, we've scrambled the geography of this ring, okay? Now, that's actually good, okay? And the reason it's good is because it means that no particular part in the, in the world here might be a hotspot. It means, uh, unfortunately, though, that we don't have the most uh, local of lookup, because if we start at node four, it'd be nice if we could just go down to 15 and back, okay? Now, this is a really good question here about redundancy. How do we get redundancy out of this? For the moment, uh, suspend that question for just a second. Um, certainly, we could put uh, RAID servers or what you know, RAID storage on each of these nodes, and that would be great if the disks fail. But uh, we would like something even more powerful because I don't know if there's a big earthquake and um, California falls off into the ocean. Um, it'd be nice to know that key 14 survived somehow. So uh, in addition to the RAID redundancy that we've been talking about in class, there's some other sort of redundancy that we want here, okay? Yeah, by the way, if you've ever uh, seen the original, uh, one of the original um, uh, Superman movies, basically the, uh, the plot is the bad guy buys up a bunch of uh, soon to be beachfront property in Nevada and then uh, has a plan to basically cause uh, California to fall into the ocean and therefore have uh, really expensive properties. Fortunately, Superman uh, saves the day and it doesn't happen. So, um, okay. So if we move um, forward with this, by the way, I'm showing you these clients now to make this a little more clear. The clients need to know one gateway into the system in order to talk to the system. Okay, so that's gonna be um, part of the initial lookup. And by the way, that's pretty similar to what happens with DNS. You need to know how to talk to local, at least one DNS server somewhere before you can start resolving names. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about is how can we make sure this, this uh, ring stays connected even though nodes are failing and coming back, okay? And so how we can make sure it's connected is we're gonna have this dynamic stabilization procedure. So um, every node can run stabilize, okay, in which it, um, asks its successor, its current successor node, who the predecessor was, and figures out, you know, is there something wrong with who's connected to whom? And then um, if it finds a problem, it can run notify to help reconnect the ring. Okay, and so let's, uh, these are the kind of things that are a lot easier to see with um, animations. And so let's suppose that we have this ring, and what I wanna show you here, for instance, is here's a new, a new node or it's a node that crashed and it's coming back, then suppose that what I want to do 
is I want to join the ring. So what do I do? Well, just like we've been talking with clients, presumably um, what I know is I know one of the nodes in the system. And if you remember, this ring has nothing to do with locality. That node could be, I don't know, eight or 15 or something, okay? And so what I need is I need this new node needs to know one gateway node. And I'm gonna say 15 just for the sake of argument. And what are we gonna to do to join? Well, we're gonna send a join message to the node we happen to know about, okay? And what's interesting about this algorithm is all that the ring is gonna do is it's gonna figure out who is responsible for storing key 50 as if this was just a regular key value lookup, okay? And so we're gonna work our way through and eventually 44 is gonna say, well, I know about 58, here you go. 58 is where key 50 would be. Okay, and notice what we've done. Now, all of a sudden, uh, node, the new node 50 knows that it needs 58 to be its successor and um, 44 to be its predecessor. So just by asking the ring where key 50 belongs, it now has some information about nodes that it can talk to. Okay, and so 50 starts by updating its successor, 58. So now it's technically connected somewhat to node 58 but you know, 44 is also connected to 58. So we now have a kind of a weird partially connected ring, okay? And let's look through what happens. So node 50 is gonna run uh, stabilize. And so it's gonna talk to the successor that it knows about and ask it, well, what's, who's its predecessor? So when it does that, what does it get back? Node 58 says, oh, your predece my predecessor is 44, okay? And at that point, now things are getting interesting because at that point, um, we can notify node 58 and say, hey, you know what? I'm actually um, a person you should know about for your predecessor. And um, we can also uh, take this connection. At some point, 44 is gonna be running its own stabilize. So stabilize is running continuously. 44 is gonna ask 58 who it thinks its predecessor is. And it's gonna say, well, I think it's 50. Okay, and at that point, what you know is, oh, 44 says something's wrong here. So it's gonna change its successor to 50. And then finally, it's gonna notify 50 about itself, at which point 50 knows its predecessor. And when all said and done, we have the, the uh, node 50 has joined. Now, what I wanna point out about this joining operation, I went through it pretty quickly, but you're welcome to go back to the slides and animate it through, is really what happens is we have this continuous stabilized procedure that everybody's running all the time. It's at, they're asking their uh, successor who the successor thinks the predecessor is, and they just run this over and over again. And what happens is the ring keeps converging into something connected. And what I'm, um, that will happen even if nodes fail and come back up and so on, it'll converge to a connected scenario here, okay? And, um, but what you can think about pretty easily, I, th I think, is if you lose two nodes in a row, then what I've just described to you is no longer gonna work. So there is a way to completely break the ring such that the stabilized procedure won't reconnect it. Um, can anybody think about what the right thing to do there is in that scenario? How do we... How do we make sure that two failed nodes in a row can't prevent the ring from re reattaching itself? Anybody? Thoughts? Yeah, perfect. We need to know more than just one successor and one predecessor, okay? And so, what that's called typically is the leaf set, okay? So the leaf set is multiple nodes. If you look at any given node, multiple nodes forward and backward called the leaf set. As long as we maintain that leaf set, then we can reconnect in a way that's gonna be stable against all sorts of uh, failures, okay? And one thing I posted last time, um, I, I could move it to today, I guess, if you want for reading, but there, one of the original chord papers talks you through about how many of these leaf set nodes you need to make the probability of a um, permanently disconnected ring so small that you wouldn't uh, care about it, okay? All right, good. Now, questions, are we good? 
Now, um, one of the things that I will point out is so far we still have this pretty um, expensive lookup process, which is order n. Now, we have figured out how to make this stable. So first of all, as long as uh, we have a fully connected ring, we can always find the storage uh, for, the, for the data, and therefore we have a correct algorithm. Now, um, the question that's uh, in the chat there is, is a good one, which is, um, suppose that we had some key stored on node 50 and node 50 disconnects, then all of a sudden key, you know, a key stored on that node or the set of keys stored on there are suddenly unavailable. I'm assuming that's what you're thinking about. And uh, that's correct. So we'll have, to, we'll have to fix that problem. Right now, we're just interested in the lookup process of figuring out which node should hold our data. We'll worry about making sure the data doesn't go away in a moment, OK? So oh, OK. Um, not exactly. Let's see. Oh, I see. If you have two, if you have um, somebody, you mean to like disconnect every other one? Um, it turns out that that will uh, converge pretty well, um, especially if you have multiple links. But um, try uh, going through the, the process and disconnect um, uh, one and another one uh, and skip one in the middle. You'll see that uh, pretty much what's going to happen is uh, you, can, you can eventually send, um, let me think about that. Yeah, so you, you, can, uh, you can eventually get this to stabilize and reconnect. Okay. Now the multiple, the really strong part about uh, keeping things connected is to have a leaf set with more than one node, by the way, though. Okay. Now, um, and what you should do is you should take a look, uh, take a look at that paper because they describe this in more detail. But um, basically what you want is a stabilization procedure that can work even when nodes, uh, several nodes in a row are failing and what you'll see is that, that uh, there's a way to do that as long as you have multiple links. And what we're going to do right now for performance is going to make that even harder to destroy the connectivity. Okay. So if you look here, the question is sort of how do we make sure that we have better than order n? Okay. And better than order n is uh, the following. What we're going to do is rather than just keeping track of nodes forward and backward, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, keep track of uh, our current position plus uh, one, our current position plus two, plus four, plus eight, plus 16, and so on. And what I mean by keep track of it is here at node 80, the question would be what node would store 81? Well, that would be 96. What node would store 82? Well, that would also be 96. What node would store 84? That'd be 96. At some point, we get to what node would store you know, uh, 80 plus 32, so 112. Well, that would be 112, okay? And we're gonna keep track of uh, a logarithmic number of these pointers. And of course, the way we find out about them is we just query the ring um, and ask it, oh, I wanna store each of these keys. And what will come back from the ring is which node's responsible. The, po the uh, powerful thing about this is once I've got all these nodes, now I can do a really fast routing process to figure out how to find which node is going to store the key I'm interested in. Okay, and one thing that's very helpful here, I think, in this context for everybody, is to think about this as bit correction. So I am at a certain position, and I'm interested in a certain key. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to correct the bits one at a time using this finger table. So my first uh, my first routing hop is going to say, well, if I'm at 80 and I want to get somewhere over on the ring, I'm going to connect, I'm going to correct the bit I've got. In this case, it would be a one in the high point. I'm going to turn it to zero by taking a long hop. And then I'll take a less long hop and so on. And I end up with a logarithmic number of hops to get me to my destination. And you can view that like I'm correcting the bits from my starting point to my ending point. I'm correcting them one at a time by taking these various hops. Okay. And that's how we end up with logarithmic um, routing time. And furthermore, this forest of additional pointers plus the extra pointers from the leaf set together make it really hard to be uh, unable to reconnect the ring. Okay, and so if you read that core paper, it talks about how you make use of all the information you've got um, to keep the ring connected. Okay, questions?
Okay, we're good. Now, let's think a little bit more about data. Okay, so um, so basically, first of all, we're going to have um, more than one forward and backward link called the leaf set. Um, and uh, in the predecessor reply message, node A can send its K minus one successors and so on. And so you can see what's going to happen is during these uh, heartbeat uh, process of looking things up, you know, asking, well, hey, my successor, who's your predecessor? During that process, um, the stabilized process, we're going to get back multiple nodes, which is going to help us get a forest of connect connectivity forward and backwards. And that's going to allow us to keep our leaf set uh, as, as correct as possible. Um, and I will point out, by the way, that these, um, these links are really uh, just an approximation of what we need. So if it turns out I try to take a hop that's long and that node is down, the one that this happens to connect to, then that's okay, it's gonna connect to 20. I'll just take the next one, okay? And so I can always revert to taking the order N uh, routing path until I've got some of these long hops available to me, okay? And so that, uh, it's a very, um, uh, it converges very nicely on a performant version of things, but it can always fall back on the uh, circular routing process if some of these fingers aren't correct. And we just keep refreshing them over and over again. And so there is a, um, a finger table look uh, lookup process that just keeps renewing these pointers over and over again. And the good thing about that is as new nodes come in, the finger table adjusts as new nodes leave or as old nodes leave, the finger table adjusts so that we keep ourselves with our log and lookup. All right. Now, um, uh, and you end up with really high probability even if half of the nodes fail. So you can, um, if you have log M, where M is the number of nodes in the system, you can end up with a situation where you can uh, find data even if half of your nodes fail, you can find data with the right number of leaf nodes. And that's kind of what's proved in that chord paper. And that's not that many because it's a logarithmic number. Okay. So, uh, before I go on to uh, storage uh, fault tolerance for the data, does anybody have any questions on this? We good? Okay. So um, now let's look back at what we had a, a slide before, right? So we had key 14s uh, stored on node 15. And the downside of this is that, of course, that um, the way I've described this, First of all, the only place for node 14 is, uh, or for key 14 to be stored is on node 15. Now, if you look at the uh, consistent hashing, what it says is if node 15 weren't there, key 14 would be stored on 20, right? That's just the, the, the next node up from 14. But since the only copy of key 14 is currently stored on node 15, if 15 dies or goes away, uh, we don't have the data. and so. So uh, it, it's fine that the consistent hashing tells us where it should be stored, but we can't store it there because we've lost our data. So we got to do something else here, okay? And the way we're going to do that is we're going to take uh, the forward leaf set, or you can do um, both forward and backwards, up, depends on the algorithm. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to store 14 on the successive nodes that we know about because of the leaf set. So we'll store it on 20 and 32, and now, What's good about this is if node 15 fails, which is the point that's supposed to store it, we've already got a copy on node 20. And node 20 can notice, oh, 15 went down. Therefore, node 20 can start the process of making sure that 35 gets a replica. And we always have three copies in our leaf set. Okay. So if we think of the leaf set as not only for keeping the ring connected, but also for how we replicate, then we can now. Uh, come up with a dynamic process that automatically adapts as nodes fail by replicating on successive nodes and making sure that we always have a, um, a given number of copies in the system in addition to the ring being connected, okay? So if node 15 fails, now what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll add an extra copy to node 35, okay? Questions? And the ring's going to stay connected because of our connectivity algorithm. And so um, what's good about this is, uh, like I said, you store the data in the cord ring and it 
uh, it's very hard to destroy. Okay, why are they called leaf sets? Um, that's a good question. The reason they're called leaf sets is because uh, in some sense you can view the, uh, if you take any given um, starting node like 58 and you view the set of fingers, that's a tree. And so uh, eventually you get to the leaf set. And, uh, and so it's like a tree with leaves. So that's where the leaf is coming from. Um, and here's an example of that. Uh, so if you look at what happens um, in, uh, with leaf sets, so what I'm gonna show you here is, here for instance is a starting node. I've got its leaf set is in green. The, the um, finger tables are in red. And suppose that I'm trying to get from here over to here. Okay, and so what I'm gonna do is um, I'm going to start bit correcting. So uh, I might take a long hop first, and now I can check all of the, um, all of the fingers, okay, or I guess you could call them branches if we don't wanna mix metaphors too much, and the leaves, and none of those quite have what I want, so I'll follow one of these branches, it's a little shorter. And then eventually I'll get to a node that's this one, where um, that node knows because of the leaf set, which node is the one I'm looking for, which is gonna be the one that's just bigger counterclockwise, or excuse me, clockwise from the ID I'm looking up, okay? And so this leaf set not only serves to help us with our replication, but it also serves as, uh, as part of the last couple of hops. We can use the leaf set to basically find who's supposed to have our data. All right. Um, now, so let's look at replication from a physical standpoint, right? So if you look again at this ring I showed you a little while ago, that ring is mapped physically to things that are spread widely. And now we can see another big advantage of the randomness introduced in CORD. And that advantage is that these copies are actually stored in geographically separate places. And so when the big one happens in California, it's not likely to take out, you know, uh, things over here in Minnesota, okay? And so we, um, the randomness is helping us to avoid um, correlated failures where, yeah, we have a bunch of copies, but they're all in the same machine room and the building got struck by lightning. So that doesn't happen in a chord algorithm. It's sort of geographically distributed by nature, okay? The downside, of course, is performance. Uh, might hurt if you happen to be too far away from a copy. Um, and so I will tell you that there are subsequent versions of Chord, which uh, when you're doing this routing and you have a lot of options here, see how we have many places we could go, we can actually uh, take places that advance us the furthest along the ring while keeping locality as short as possible. And so we can actually take locality into effect to some extent in Chord and, um, and make our routing less like bouncing back and forth across the planet randomly and more like working our way uh, physically toward the thing that we're interested in. All right, good. Last but not least, um, and, and I didn't have slides for this, but I wanted to point this out. Uh, one of the things we can do with CORD is we can use CORD to store locations of data rather than the data. And so think of this like a DNS built out of CORD. And so what the client does is the client doesn't know where the data they're interested in is, they ask the cord ring, the cord ring tells them who to talk to and then they can talk directly to them uh, and exchange data over the shortest path possible using uh, TCP IP or whatever. And so you can now get the best uh, of both worlds in that you have a very hard to destroy lookup process. And then you can choose, here's the client and it's using some data, you can choose to replicate uh, that data on uh, close to the client and maybe a couple other places close to the client, even though the initial lookup might be geographically separate, once you start using the data and know where it is, you can have good locality out of it. And that's pretty much what we did with the, the uh, tapestry lookup process back uh, for Ocean Store. Okay. So I did wanna point out that what I've just described to you, this cord ring is actually used in lots of uh, cloud services these days, the idea at least. So for instance, DynamoDB, and I have a paper for that up on the reading from last time, uh, uses the cord rings, and you can look down here, but it uses them rather than spreading them around the planet, it uses them within their machine rooms as a way to distribute load uh, and 
So when you're uh, ordering things from Amazon and you're ordering, you know, you're putting things in your cart, all of that data is actually stored in something like Cord that's in a machine room. Okay, and the applications, uh, because they're worried about people and uh, not um, pissing them off when they want them to buy things, uh, what the Cord Ring is really about is making sure that they can get their performance uh, for retrieving something within a small number of nines, okay? And so the availability is an important aspect here. And so um, basically you have a service guarantee that says we'll get a response within 300 milliseconds uh, for say 99.9% .9 of the requests, okay? And so that's part of the way that the cord algorithms are adapted in, uh, in a re real cloud service, okay? All right. And um, notice that this is very, uh, in contrast, essentially, to what we've been talking about a lot of the rest of the term, uh, which is focusing on mean response time. Instead, we want to have guaranteed performance. Okay, and this is again thinking. I want, to, I want you to think back to when we were talking about um, we were talking about real time scheduling, and what was important there was keeping the uh, predictability of the scheduling time uh, low. Uh, you know, keeping the predictability high and keeping the timing tight rather than worrying about making it as fast as possible. So S3 is actually using something slightly different, but um, there's lots of different schemes out there. What's good about the various uh, things that are using cord-like uh, cord -like algorithms is this is scalable. Um, as you can imagine, you, if you don't have enough performance, you can just start adding more nodes and it adapts automatically, which is pretty good. So what I wanted to do next, uh, I'm, I'm going to leave that there a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about security and then um, talk through a couple of things. And then I want to uh, try to get to quantum computing as well. So we can, I know there was some of you asked some questions about that. So I'm going to leave this topic unless there's more questions. Okay, so I'm going to talk through a couple of uh, things that I'm pretty, sh I'm assuming everybody kind of knows, but I want to make sure we all have the same terminology. So. Um, you know, security is an interesting thing. It's basically computing in the presence of an adversary. So I'm assuming several of you have all taken 161. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. We have a very small class tonight. But um, you can start worrying about things like, um, can that adversary uh, prevent me from making forward progress? Or can failure prevent me from uh, reliability, robustness, fault tolerance, et cetera? Um, Security is kind of dealing with actions of a knowledgeable attacker uh, who's really trying to cause har harm. And we want to make sure that uh, they can't really screw us up. Okay, And we talked about Byzantine agreement uh, a couple of weeks ago. That's one example of trying to prevent a decision-making process from working. Um, but in general, uh, security is kind of dealing with situations where there's an adversary, uh, there's a security problem. Okay. And there's been many problems, okay, where people have broken in to systems, and um, you know it's a it's a constant arms race uh, preventing people from breaking into things you care about by using new techniques. Um, and the distinction between protection and security, I think, is an important one because protection is the set of mechanisms uh, that we talk about in this class. Security is basically using those mechanisms to prevent misuse of resources. So for instance, virtual memory is a mechanism that can be used for protection. Security policy would be making sure that when we use virtual memory, we don't let uh, malicious processes or different processes owned by different people uh, use the same memory and have the potential for screwing each other up. So that would be a security policy built with uh, our protection mechanisms, okay? So I wanted to point out something interesting. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but um, here is a car in a ditch. And what's interesting about this particular car in the ditch is that back in July of 2015, there's a team of researchers that took complete control of a Jeep SUV remotely, um, and exploited a firmware attack uh, over the Sprint cellular network. And um, they basically caused the car to speed up and slow down and, and uh, veer off the road and uh, totally wirelessly. So this is a little scary. Uh, to think about. Uh, now, fortunately, no humans were harmed, and the people that whose car was driven off the road were researchers as well. But um, 
you know, this is something that one might hope our security policies could prevent. And the thing that is getting in the way of preventing things like this is that there's an increasing amount of machine to machine communication where it's really machines are talking to other machines controlling each other and um, making sure that a, a malicious person can't get into the middle of that and cause uh, unexpected behavior is very tricky. And um, there's this term cyber physical systems, which I don't know if, how many of you have heard of that, but the idea is computers controlling physical things uh, using policies and algorithms. And um, the problem is that if somebody manages to get in and mess with those cyber physical systems, uh, they can cause physical harm, okay? And that's a problem. So part of this question is the following. So let's talk about the data. So there was firmware in this car. So one might argue that one of the problems was that firmware was accepted as uh, authentic, even though it came from a malicious third party. And so one of the questions that's important is, do you know where your data came from? That's a provenance question. Another is, do you know whether it's been ordered or changed or uh, altered in any way? That's an integrity question. And really this is a question of the rise of fake data, which is kind of much worse than fake news, which is about corrupting the data and making the system behave very badly. So, um, you know, we have several security requirements that people talk about. So authentication is making sure that a user who's making changes to the system is really who they claim to be. Um, data integrity is making sure that the data hasn't changed. Okay, so that's important. Confidentiality is making sure that the data is read only um, by authorized users. So that often involves encryption of some sort. And then non-repudiation is a surprisingly important thing that people don't often talk about, which is that um, if one sender makes a statement and they uh, send a message or whatever, they can't later claim that, well, I didn't really send that, somebody malicious did. And so that's basically making sure that you can't repudiate things that you've previously said. And so I'm hoping that uh, if you haven't taken 161, it's on your list, because there's a very interesting set of things that people can talk about. But um, Cryptography is one of the central points of many of these mechanisms. You just have to use it correctly. And this is communication that's in the presence of adversaries. Uh, it's been studied for thousands of years. There's actually uh, something called the code book, which you should look up, which talks about you know, thousands of years of cryptography. And the central goal has always been confidentiality about encoding information so an adversary can't extract it. The general premise is that there, you know, there's a key and if you have the key, you can decode things. If you don't have the key, it's impossible. Uh, what's gotten more interesting over the years, of course, is public key cryptography, where there's really two associated keys and you encode with one and decode with the other. And that really leads to all sorts of really interesting authentication problems. Okay, so basic uh, cryptography, uh, which you've probably heard about is you have a secret key and um, you take the plain text and you encrypt it with the secret key and you send over the internet something called ciphertext, which is encrypted, and you can decrypt it the other side. And um, assuming that uh, the key hasn't been leaked, then it's not possible for an adversary, and, and you have a good algorithm like AES, it's not possible for an adversary to send a message uh, that the receiver will treat as real because you have to have the secret key. Now, one thing you do need to do in order to make this single uh, symmetric key encryption work, which is symmetric because the same secrets used at both sides, is to prevent an adversary from holding on to an old message and sending it later is you have to start adding what are called nonces, which are things like timestamps and so on, so that every time you send this, it's unique. And if somebody sends an old version, you can detect it. But I'm assuming everybody understands the idea of encryption with, uh, with a symmetric key. Um, and the other thing is I mentioned hashes earlier. And so the idea of a secure hash function is one where you take data and you run it through a hash function and you get a bunch of bits out of it. And if you change the data even slightly, you end up with a good hash function with something that essentially roughly half of the bits change. So um, this, you know, the change from Fox to the red Fox runs across the ice will give you something very different. If you take Fox and you add a few uh, things after it, it'll also change it uh, drastically, okay? And so the hash we often talk about is the hash of a message is a set of bits. 
um, say 256 bits. And this is a good example of what we used on the cord ring where that ring was two to the M possibilities. Well, that might be a, uh, the result of a hash function like SHA-256, okay? And what makes this secure is that it's not possible for somebody to come up with another source that matches the hash function, okay? That's one uh, example of something that's not possible. In fact, it's not even easy with a good secure hash function to come up with two different items that you come up with yourself that have the same hash function. Okay, and so that's why we can kind of use hashes as a proxy for the data itself. And uh, a lot of the things you hear about in, in uh, secure security literature using cryptography assume that the hash function is a, is a reasonable proxy for the data itself. Okay, so SHA-256 is a good example. So here we can, for instance, if we uh, share a, a key, K, what we can do is we can, and that key is secret, we can take a plain text, something like a contract, and we can run it through a hash function where we take that key and, and append M, and that's called a digest now. We can send that across and the data. And at the other side, we can verify by re, uh, computing that HMAC, okay? And if they match the one that was sent across versus the one that you computed yourself, then you can know that the message is not corrupted, otherwise it's corrupted. And so we can use hashes to prove later that, you know, after the, the transmission has happened that the data is authentic. Okay, so hashing is pretty powerful. And I'm not going to have a lot of time to go through this um, with you. That's a 161 topic, but just, you know, keep that in your uh, lexicon about hashing being a good way to uh, ensure the integrity of data at the other side. And so, for instance, in that firmware problem with the car, we could uh, have a key that only came from the manufacturer uh, in a secret way, and we could check the uh, integrity of that firmware against the manufacturer. And if it wasn't, uh, you know, if the integrity wasn't high, you know, it was basically didn't match, then we could know that that firmware is probably bogus and we shouldn't be using it. Okay. Now the downside, of course, of everything we've talked about is both sides share the same key. And so if you leak the key, then you got problems, okay? And furthermore, you have to somehow share the key. And so that requires you to go in a dark alley and you know hand the key over. And so this seems like only part of the solution. And um, the interesting thing about that is this idea of public private key pairs and uh, public key encryption, which um, again, the cool thing about that is that now uh, you can distribute um, the public key, let's suppose that somebody over here wants to uh, have anybody send them a secure message. They generate a public private key pair. They give the public key to somebody else. They, pro they can broadcast it uh, you know, to the world. And uh, then anybody who wants to send a message just encrypts it with the public key. And the only way to decrypt is private key. And that private key is something that I hold uh, secret, but the public key I broadcast. And so this is basically, uh, this is the, the uh, basis for all sorts of modern algorithms, okay? Um, among other things, if I were to encrypt uh, the hash over data and then uh, encrypt it with a public key, then I can know for a fact that that data has made it through um, and only could have come from somebody, okay? So that's part of uh, how we actually sign things, all right? So, um, for instance, here's Alice and Bob. Let me show you a fun algorithm here. Bob sends his public key out into the wild to Alice. Um, now Alice can encrypt messages and send them to Bob and only Bob can decrypt them. Alice can send her public key and now Bob can send things to her. And what we're done with is now we've got a secure channel between the two of them given public information. All right, and now this is another mechanism we can build all sorts of stuff about. Okay. Now the, uh, the uh, question about how to know whether this is a valid public key requires public key infrastructure, but uh, that's another story. So now I'm, I'm going, I went through this very quickly. How many people have uh, never seen, anybody uh, never seen this kind of thing before? Or is this all pretty familiar? Okay, good, oh, great. This is in CS70, great. So let's talk about uh, a project that I've been working on. 
So again, um, you could view security as trying to protect things with a firewall, or you could view security as it's all about the data. And if you can protect the data, then you can protect everything, okay? And so if you think about the Internet of Things, really uh, one way to look at the Internet of Things is that we have a whole bunch of devices and compute elements all over the world, and it's really a graph of services that we want to connect. And so um, distributed storage is everywhere. Um, every arrow represents communication. We've got storage everywhere. And really what we want to do is we want to make sure that the data can only be written by authorized parties and only read by authorized parties. Okay, and these secure enclaves um, are a topic for another day as well, but this is a uh, special um, virtual machine that's in modern hardware that basically allows you to set up a secure channel and do some secure encryption in a way that um, not even a um, uh, not even the local operating system can see the data. Okay, and so if we have these secure enclaves stored everywhere and secure encrypted data, then perhaps we can do some interesting things. Okay, and we can do them securely. And so um, let me see. I'm running low on time here. I wanted to say something a little bit interesting here about. Um, why data breaches, which we've heard a lot about in the last four years, are so prevalent, okay? And if you look, the problem is that people who are trying to build secure systems kind of think of it this way. They say, well, I've got a secure network on the left. I've got a secure cloud in the middle. I've got a secure uh, network on the right. And they're so secure that the only thing I have to worry about is securing the communication between these uh, parties. And if I do that, then the system's secure, okay? And so this is what I like to call as border security rather than data security. And so if you think, well, I'm gonna put some firewalls and now I can say, look, this is a trusted computing base that's secure. This is one as well. There's one around the cloud. Um, and then, you know, the only thing left is cell phones, which I make secure tunnels with, and this just is fine. Um, the problem with this point of view, which you've probably heard about everywhere is, the moment that we have any breaches inside the uh, trusted computing base, then all of a sudden, not only is the data uh, breached, but somebody who is inside that firewall can produce data that looks authentic, uh, even though it's not, because people are trusting, well, if it came through the firewall properly, then it must be authentic. And if you think back to cybersecurity, you know, um, if you think back to what we've been talking about with that car, suddenly that might be that you could have firmware that looks like it's uh, from the manufacturer, even though it's from an adversary. And now we suddenly have this issue that physical devices that are trusting on this security suddenly start performing things they're not supposed to. Okay, so the real reason we get these data breaches everywhere is because people think that they can put these boundaries up in a way that don't, um, can't be breached. And of course, we know that's not true. And basically, uh, the problem really is not only are things breached, but the integrity and the provenance of that data is not known. So what do we do? The data-centric vision, which is one that um, I've adopted in uh, my research group, is one in which we think about shipping containers full of data. So if you think about uh, down the port of Oakland, you've probably all seen these shipping containers. Um, this was a, a great invention back in 1956. So before 1956, what happened was we had uh, longshoremen who would take a bunch of things and they would go to a ship and they'd play Tetris with it to try to fit all of these things onto the ship. And then the ship would go to its destination and then there'd be people there that would unpack them and then you'd have to figure out how to put them on trucks and so on. And um, it was a mess. And basically one person that said, well, why don't we just make things that are all the same size and shape? And then all of a sudden we've got ships, trains, cranes, all of the, the uh, uh, infrastructure for handling these things are the same across the planet. And now I can ship something from my house in Lafayette to Beijing, uh, the outskirts of Beijing, uh, just by calling the right trucks to come pick up a shipping container, which gets taken to the port of Oakland and put on a ship, and then it goes across the ocean and it's unloaded and, and so on. And um, why is that that standardization of the container? So the idea that uh, we've done in our group is to say, can we use this idea to help in some way? 
And the idea is very simply that we think of shipping containers full of data, which we call data capsules. And the reason I've got this little green bound around here is because it's a, it's a data capsule. And inside the data capsule is uh, a bunch of transactions that are hashed. So remember those hashes we talked about and signed where we, uh, we use a private key to sign a hash over something. And as a result, we trust that this really came from the person who said it did because only they could have the private key. And as a result of these data capsules, this gives us a uh, cryptographically secure way of moving data around to the edge, to the cloud and back again in a way that um, nobody can fake out, okay? Um, another way to look at this is this is like almost a blockchain in a box, okay? And so what we're doing in our group is we're looking at uh, how to take these data capsules, make them a standard in a way that everybody uses them. And on top of them, you can build file systems and databases and everything you're used to. But underneath the network knows how to ship these things around and route queries to them. And so um, think of this again, the underlying uh, network is like the ships and trains and cranes and planes that handle this standardized metadata. And what is the standardized metadata? Well, it's a, a hash over an owner uh, key and some other metadata about who created this. And that forms a unique address uh, that you can route to in our system, unlike, um, not unlike an IP address, but it's a unique uh, hash over the data. And you can imagine these things being small, so they could be on phones or really large, so they could be you know, terabyte sized databases. But that standardized metadata is really what allows them to uh, be shared uh, securely across the planet, pretty much. Okay, so why is this idea help? It, it, the networking effect, okay? I'm actually pun intended here. So standardization makes it possible for the infrastructure uh, to be put everywhere and it benefits everyone. Um, federation, you can actually build a market of service providers. Um, the data becomes a first class entity. So your data basically can float pretty much anywhere. So you could put a data, a, a data capsule server in your house and all of a sudden your local data capsules could be stored there. Or if you're doing some communication uh, with somebody else, you could get a copy of their data capsules. And again, because it's like a blockchain in a box, it's not possible for somebody to fake data that doesn't belong in there, okay? And so think back to that firmware issue with the car in the ditch, okay? And um, the other thing is that metadata we're looking at actually has details about what the network should and should not enforce. And so you can even start talking about privacy, where if you had a bunch of cameras in a local edge domain and they were taking a bunch of data and putting them in data capsules, um, you could make sure that the network would refuse to route those, say outside of the house or outside of your building, uh, if that was disallowed. Okay. All right. So the vision here is really the following. Um, it's, you have a bunch of resources underneath. These are spread in the cloud and through endpoint places all over the network. You've got uh, data capsules that have the ability to float anywhere they're allowed. And that's what we call the global data plane. Okay, so um, the global data plane is something that is, uh, spans the globe, just like, uh, if you remember, just like the cord uh, ring spanned the globe. Okay, it's again, it's a peer-to-peer -peer system uh, just like IP as well, that does routing and multicast, that has things we call trust domains and accounting. Um, below, you can have many utility providers, kind of like Comcast or AT&T, that all provide service. And above, there's an API that allows all of these apps to access their data in the data capsules, okay? And so this is like me in my house calling a truck to pick up a uh, shipping container, okay? And so this vision, if this, uh, is ultimately complete is one where you, instead of paying for IP service, you would pay for data capsule service and um, you'd be able to store your data in a way that was secure. Okay. And could be used anywhere you want and you'd own your data. Okay. So a physical view, just to one last little slide here and then I'll move on to, to um, the uh, quantum computing. So I wanna make sure we cover that. But uh, if you think about IP, the way we talked about it briefly in a couple of weeks uh, prior. If you look at the physical view of IP, there's a bunch of uh, routing clouds and there's also transit providers, okay? And so this is exactly how we get IP working. 
And so in the global data plane, we do the same thing where we have global data plane uh, domains. We have routers that route global data plane traffic and they're tied together uh, just like we get with TCP IP. Okay, they're appearing arrangements just like with IP. And as a result, and we have name resolvers that help us find our data capsules. And as a result, we could actually have, uh, forgive me building all this up, but we can actually have clients, which might be compute, they might be little robots, they might be smart cars or Teslas, can all tie in to the global data plane and access data that they're authorized to do uh, anywhere it happens to be. And if they need high performance or privacy, they can pull it to their local domain. And so the physical view of the GDP is really, um, instead of thinking about packets, you're now thinking about data and its integrity and its provenance. Okay, so it's a, it's a switch in viewpoint on how we wanna be dealing with data. All right, sorry if that's a lot of information, but I wanted to see if there's any uh, questions there before I uh, switch over to some quantum computing. All righty, give me a second. I'll be right back and then we'll see if there are any questions that came up. One moment. Okay, so. Good, so we have some good questions here. So first question is, how do we know the data is secured? So um, just like with a blockchain, let me just back up to the picture here, which I think is a, is a good one to be talking about. Um, what we know is the following. The metadata is, uh, among other things, the public key of an owner hashed, okay? And so all of these signatures have to be signed by the owner and anybody can verify that um, the data that's in here was put in there by the right owner, okay? So that gives us integrity and providence. It means that we can know that none of the data that's in here could have been put there by an adversary. So that's the first, um, thing that we know. And the second thing is, of course, we can put arbitrary encryption on top of this as well to make it uh, private. So really the signatures are about integrity and who put the data there. And uh, the encryption would be about privacy. And there are many ways of uh, deciding kind of which keys to use for that encryption and how to share them with people you want to decrypt. Okay, and so that's the, that's the, um, the security of this. And uh, what you know is when you get some data from the network, you can immediately verify that that data is uh, what it's supposed to be. So you can, you can check that the signatures um, are correct. And if you have a signature only at the end of a chain of data, you can essentially check the rest of the chain by checking the hash pointers. So these are all of the things you get out of a blockchain, by the way, for those of you that are familiar with Bitcoin or whatever. Um, you get it here with the data capsules. And so I like to call these cryptographically uh, hardened bundles of data. Um, and if somebody tries to put garbage in there, a legitimate person who's trying to look at this can just throw the garbage out because there's no way that that garbage could have been put in there uh, in a way that meets the integrity constraints of the data, okay? And so it's not forgeable. Um, it's, uh, it maintains its integrity. The, the transactions can't be swapped or whatever. And so it's a, it's a uniquely um, uh, uh, high integrity kind of bundle of data. And if you build file systems and what have you on top of this, really what you're doing is you're appending data to that and it becomes a, um, a secure log on which you can build pretty much databases, you can build file systems, all sorts of stuff, okay? So this linked structure within the data capsule is really, um, is just think of this like Git. You guys are all familiar with Git now. So this is like a Git tree uh, with signatures and uh, integrity through hashes, okay? And the signatures can't be faked again because only the proper owner knows the private key to produce the signatures, okay? And so if you breach the private key, of course that's a problem, but potentially every data capsule could have a unique private key, uh, which leads to a, an interesting key management issue, but um, that could be another topic. Okay, did I answer those questions? So the vision here really is of pretty much everybody using data capsules everywhere, okay? And um, if you can get that to happen, then, uh, you know, basically 
you potentially have um, a very interesting scenario here. Now, I just wanted to share uh, another uh, point here really quickly. So for instance, the way we're looking at our routing plane is really um, the data plane itself is a, is a series of routers that all know kind of where the data capsules are and have some very interesting properties where if any of you want to come work on this project, come talk to me uh, separately. We have plenty of uh, places we can talk to you, OK? Now I'm gonna. Um, I want to. I promised you some. Um, I, I promised you some uh, quantum computing. I did want to show you one other interesting slide here, potentially, uh, which shows you kind of an idea of how we can build things up um, here. So uh, the data capsule infrastructure is is spans the globe, kind of just like TCP/IP does. And so in that scenario, um, what you get is you get uh, potentially these GDP switches, which are just overlay network on top of IP. Uh, you can have location services uh, and storage services for storing data capsules. You can have secure enclaves, which lets you do secure computation. And then you can have lots of uh, interesting clients. And part of what we're doing is we're working with uh, roboticists uh, and machine learning folks to put their data and their models for grasping and so on inside of data capsules. And as a result, they can res reside securely in, uh, in the edge in say your robots or whatever in a way that can't be uh, uh, breached, okay? And so this is uh, really targeted at uh, secure edge infrastructure um, in addition to the cloud. So these data capsules can move back and forth, but certainly you need something like this on the edge because these pieces of hardware are easily breached and you wanna make sure your data is is uh, secured and unforgeable. All right, good. So let me say a little bit about using quantum mechanics to compute. And since there's only a few of you tonight, if you're uh, willing to hear me out, I can talk for a little bit longer just to uh, get through a couple of other things on quantum computing. Um, but uh, you know, what does it mean to use quantum mechanics to compute? So. It's basically uh, using weird but kind of useful properties of quantum mechanics, um, two of them, quantization and superposition. I don't know how many of you have taken a quantum mechanics class, um, but uh, what you find out is, for instance, back in chemistry, if you remember from chemistry, you had the orbitals, right? And so only electrons were only allowed in certain rings or spheres actually around atoms, and that was because of quantum mechanics. That's quantization. That says that the, uh, the electron could either be, you know, at one point, the S equals zero or the S equal one or S equal two, but nowhere in between. And that quantization really gives us the ability to talk about something like a one or a zero. So we got the idea of digital data buried in that quantization, but because it's quantum mechanics, we can do the second thing, which is superposition. And this is having uh, a bit which is both a zero and a one in certain fraction of uh, between the two. And that's where things get interesting, okay? It's like it's 50% zero, 50% one, or something in between, that's called superposition. And um, what's interesting to me, so I've you know, designed computers in, in various times in my life, is that most digital abstractions that you might learn about in 151 or Pick, pick your 141, some of those uh, various um, VLSI classes, is you spend a lot of time trying to get rid of the quantum effects. You want a zero to be a zero, and you want a one to be a one, and you want them to stay that way. And it's when they don't stay that way that you got problems. So then you put error correction codes and all that stuff that we talked about uh, last week and the week before. Quantum mechanics, however, if you're willing to allow things to not be always a one or always a zero, what you can do is you can just start doing quantum computing and that's basically using quantization and superposition to compute, okay? And so some interesting results just to tell you uh, quickly here is for instance, Shor's factoring algorithm factors uh, large numbers in polynomial time, even though the best uh, known classical ones are sub-exponential um, in the number of bits. And so, you know, if you could get a Shor's algorithm running on a quantum computer, pretty much all RSA um, cryptography would be uh, broken because you could factor, okay? Um, so uh, other interesting results here are, for instance, Grover's algorithm um, is, is not as 
spectacular, but it's still pretty interesting. So imagine you've got an unsorted database of millions of elements. Okay, so what does unsorted mean? So it's not sorted, right? So if you wanted to find a value, uh, what, you know, on average, how many elements would you have to look through in a million items before you found the one you want? Well, on average, you'd have to look at half of them. And however, Grover's algorithm using a quantum computer lets you find items in an unsorted database in a time that's uh, square root in n rather than half of n. Okay, um, that's pretty interesting, right? Um, the other uh, so uh, 191 is mentioned in the chat. That's a good class to take if you're interested in quantum computing. Um, another one that's my favorite, I think, best uh, application of quantum computing is what I like to call material simulation. Um, this was kind of the original, uh, the original application of quantum computing that was uh, thought of. And um, basically the idea there is if I want to design a brand new element uh, or brand new material to build things out of, um, and I want to take into effect all the quantum mechanic effects, then uh, exponentially, I'd, or uh, classically, I'd have to build something that was exponentially hard, but it'd be linear time in, uh, in a quantum uh, computer. And so if I'm really interested in designing exotic new materials to build interesting things, I probably want a quantum computer. So there are many other uh, algorithms out there now these days, they've been slowly working on them, but these are some pretty good ones that give you an idea why this might be interesting. Okay, and furthermore, we've got Google, we've got IBM. Um, it's very popular these days with big companies uh, Microsoft is in here as well, looking at building these quantum machines. Um, both of these two, both Google and IBM are superconducting bits. So these uh, parts of the machine you see here are normally put into a doer and they're running uh, you know, at four degrees Kelvin or something really cold. Um, this particular type of quantum computing technology is not gonna be in your laptop, um, or at least not in any laptop I'd wanna put on my lap. Um, but uh, there are other types of technologies, uh, including ion traps, that uh, potentially are pretty interesting that um, there have been some thoughts over the years might be able to run at something closer to uh, room temperature. Not there yet. The current goal of Google and IBM, and, and there's been some notion that maybe they've shown this, um, is to do something uh, which they call quantum supremacy, which is basically to prove that there really is uh, a possibility that quantum computers could be faster than classical ones. And so the, the issue here is that um, these computers by being built by Google and IBM have you know maybe of order 100 bits maximum. It's very hard to do anything interesting with 100 bits, but they're focusing on demonstrations that show that with those 100 bits, they could potentially do something a lot better than a classical machine. So that's called quantum supremacy. So what I wanted to um, do just to give you a little flavor for quantum computing that you can go away with here is um, here's, a, here's a version of quantization that's particularly simple to get once you got it. And that is there are certain particles, so protons and electrons and neutrons, those are good examples, that are what are called spin one half particles. And um, physicists treat these things like they're spinning like a top, okay, except um, what's interesting about that is that they can only spin with the axis pointing up or down, nowhere in between. Okay, that's the quantization thing. And um, what I'm showing is this is the spin relative to a magnetic uh, pole, north and south. And what's interesting about that spin up or spin down, down is that now I've got zero and one. Okay, so suddenly I've got binary. That's interesting, right? And um, so these are particles like protons or electrons have this intrinsic spin. And um, so now I got one and zero or up and down. Okay. And a representation called the Heisenberg representation looks at this uh, messy physical situation like this, which is either a zero or a one in these brackets. Um, and that represents spin up and spin down. Okay or vice versa, depending on how you want um, to, what it's looking like. If you're with the field, then that's a lower energy. So that's probably spin zero, it's probably zero. Um, now, one proposal for building quantum computers from way back when was called the Kane proposal. And those spins 
were actually what you got when you um, embedded phosphorus impurity atoms into silicon. And then those phosphorus impurities would have a spin up or spin down that could be treated as one and zero. And then you could actually use these electrons to manipulate, okay? And that was um, one of several sort of uh, what I like to think of as scalable solutions built on top of silicon, which are you know exciting because maybe you could get Moore's law out of them. Um, and this is an example of something people were looking at. Okay, but the temperature here was less than one Kelvin, which is really cold. Okay, um, but let's suppose now here's where the quantum computingness gets pretty tricky. Okay, and and uh, bear with me just a little bit. I know I'm going a tiny bit over here, but um, if you think of the zero and the one thing, okay, this is actually a wave function if you take quantum mechanics representing spin up and spin down. And what's interesting is the wave function in quantum mechanics is actually a complex uh, function um, that I can add together uh, C0 plus C1 as a complex coefficient. And all I need to make sure is that the um, uh, C0 uh, squared plus C1 squared is equal to one. So what happens is these actually end up being probabilities that if I actually tried to look, I would see a zero, or if I actually tried to look, I'd see a one. And so what you see here, okay, with this psi function is actually a superposition of zeroness and oneness together. Okay, now, you know, I realize this looks a little weird. We don't normally get uh, wave function notation in 162. But um, the thing that's, uh, like I said, is very interesting about this is that this is a description of uh, a combination of zeroness and oneness where the probabilities can be adjusted anywhere, any way you want, such that they, their squares, their norm squared adds up to one. Okay, and if you measure the bits, you actually said, well, do I have a zero or I have a one? What's funny is you find out you don't have this thing because when you look at it, you either find up or down with a given probability. Okay, all right, now bear with me. So those of you that are skeptics out there, would say, oh, really, I don't know whether it's a zero or one. So these, these C0 and C1s really represent uh, my lack of knowledge. But once I finally looked, I found out what it was, okay? I'm sure that there are several of you that think that that's the case. Um, but that's one option. The other is that this is a real effect in the proton or whatever we're looking at here is actually sort of in one state and sort of in another. Okay, and those are those are two options, and it turned out that there was uh, there's a set of famous Bell uh, inequality experiments that were done that showed that reality is actually the second choice. So in fact, as weird as it is, uh, that proton is is a, a combination of zero and one at the beginning, and it's only when we look carefully and force it to be one or the other when we actually try to measure it, then it gets forced into a state. Okay. And so if you think about this in terms of building a quantum computer, there's a couple of interesting things here. So one, we gotta make sure that the environment never measures before we're ready because otherwise we'll destroy this interesting superposition and maybe we need that to compute, okay? And just to get a better notion of how weird this really is, okay? So if I have a bunch of bits, n bits together, there's two to the n possible values of n bits. You know that, right? But here's an example of a three-bit example of a superposition in which there are eight options and I can simultaneously have one of those eight or many of those eight values in different proportions as long as the probability um, sums up to one, okay? So as long as C00 uh, norm squared plus C001 norm squared plus this, plus this, plus this, plus this, sum up to one, that's a real physical situation which represents a single register in my computer that has uh, a superposition of all of those values. And the moment I take a look, then I force it to be one uh, value, okay? Um, and so uh, if you only measure one bit, for instance, you can say that the first bit will be a zero with probability what? Well, which ones have a zero in the first bit? This one, this one, this one, this one. So the probability of finding a zero in the first bit is this sum. Probability of finding a one in the first bit is this sum. 
and um, you can go from there, okay? So we really don't want the environment to measure this before it's ready. So in fact, we can have quantum error correction codes, believe it or not, which can protect this quantum information from being measured by accident by the environment. And as a result, um, really we can, uh, we can hold these quantum states for a long enough period of time to actually do something interesting with them. So let me show you this uh, simple two-bit state. Okay, this is called an EPR pair for Einstein, Podonsky, Rosen. It was produced by Einstein, uh, and Podonsky, and Rosen as a thought experiment. And the idea is I've got two bits, but I don't have all four options. I only have a zero, zero, or a one, one. Okay, those are my two options. And I separate the two bits, so this is the two spins. And in fact, what I do is I maybe send one on a rocket ship to go light years away. And so now these two bits represented by this state are light years away. And if we measure one of them, like let's suppose we measure and find that there's a zero back on earth, we know instantaneously that we got a zero on the other side, okay? And so that looks like we had faster than light travel, in fact, instantaneous travel of information from the earth out to that that far planet, um, Einstein really didn't like this. He called it spooky action at a distance, okay? But in fact, uh, what's interesting about this is you can prove that there's no actual information transferred, okay? So however, we can uh, use this to do what's called teleportation, um, which is take information uh, at one side do some measurements, send some data to the remote side and recreate the data, recreate the quantum state uh, at the other side and that's called teleportation. Okay, all right. So I'm about to lose uh, a bunch of you, but let me just show you how you factor with this because I think this is interesting. So the way we build a, a computer is we take a complex state like I just showed you um, and then we put it through a bunch of adders, whatever you want to call it, which are really all unitary transformations. They're things that make sure that that probability always adds up to one. And then we measure a result and the output is our answer, okay? So basic computing paradigm. You input register with superposed values. You do a bunch of computing on it such that the probabilities are kept and you measure, okay? And the way it looks is that you take, uh, let's say you put an input with all possible combinations of the input input uh, of the inputs being equal values, all possible probabilities. It looks like you're doing computation on all possible values at once. But then when you measure, you pick up exactly one and that's the answer you get, okay? And uh, if you don't do anything very interesting here, this is gonna look like uh, you randomly picked some input and computed on it. So basically what we're talking about here looks like a random computation like you get in CS70 or 170, where you randomly pick an input, you compute on it, you look at the result. So that's not very interesting, right? Because we already know how to do that. What we would like is we'd like it to be such that if you take this input state and you um, put an input that's a complex combination of possible inputs, you run it through a quantum state, a quantum computer, and you measure the output is with high probability some answer that was hard to find. That's what we'd like, okay? And so if you look here, um, you know, if the two n inputs are equally probable, there could be two of the n outputs that are equally probable. And um, what we'd like is the probability of the outputs to be piled up high on the answer we want. And it turns out that something like Fourier transform does the trick, okay? So if we can do a Fourier transform, on some input, we can actually get an interesting output. So if you bear with me, I'm gonna show you Shor's factoring in one slide. So this is something that would break RSA, okay? We can basically say um, the difficulty of factoring RSA, uh, this is the type of cryptography that you might use with your bank across the internet, is figuring out how to take a large number, which is publicly known, and factor it into two large factors that are primes. And if you can do that, you break the cryptography. So classically, uh, this is an exponential time algorithm. And so as long as these are big enough, nobody's gonna break it. Quantum computer can do it polynomial time. And let me show you how. Here's how it is in a nutshell. You pick a random X between zero and N. 
That's easy. You say if the GCD, uh, the greatest common div divisor between X and N is not one, you just found a factor, you win. Let's assume you didn't do that. We find the smallest integer R such that X raised to the R is, is congruent to one mod N. Okay, so that uh, you know, basically is doing modulo multiply. That's really hard to do well and easy. If R is odd, we got to repeat. If R is even, then we can say, well, I know because X to the R is equivalent to one mod N, I know that um, X to the R over two mod N um, is equal to A. And so then I can find this, A minus one times A plus one is a factor of N. And um, we have another failure mode here where A is equal to N minus one, but if it isn't, GCD of A plus or minus one N is a non-trivial factor. So if we could somehow figure this out, what R makes this equi uh, equation satisfied and we could do that quickly, then um, we win. And that's something that uh, you can't do easily classically, but with a quantum computer, what we can do, and unfortunately, I guess I don't have time to do this uh, it, because we're running out of time, but I can set up a situation where my input to my algorithm is all the possible Ks uh, if I take a bunch of values and I compute uh, the, the value um, X to that value and I add them all together as a superposition and I do a Fourier transform, what I'll find is that X to the R congruent to one as I have R go through all its possible values is gonna uh, be a periodic function. Why? Because if X to the R is equivalent to one, then X to the two R is equivalent to the one, and X to the three R is equivalent to one. And so I can do, um, I can essentially do a Fourier transform in, uh, in a quantum computer. I can get these peaks and that Fourier transform will tell me what the frequencies are and that will give me that value that I need, which I can do this. I have to repeat this a polynomial number of times and then voila, I've just factored that number. Okay, so that's the essence of the Shor's factoring algorithm. And it all hinges on the fact that I can come up with this superposition state where um, it's all possible values of X to the K where K varies from zero to N. Okay, and I put them all together in a superposition state. I do a Fourier transform, I get the result. Now, the interesting question is, is this something to worry about? And the answer is, well, so far, no, but it's looking like um, it's getting closer and closer. Okay, and so I would say um, there's been a lot of very interest, uh, interesting effort in quantum computing in the last five years, um, enough that I, I did a lot of uh, research on quantum computers um, in, in the early 2000s and, and uh, also the 20, up to 2010, 2011. Um, I think it's looking more promising now. Um, one of the things that we did do, and, I, and we don't have time to talk about this, but we actually investigated if you were to build uh, that factoring algorithm and you could do it as quantum circuits that could run on a quantum computer, what would that look like? And we actually investigated ways of optimizing that. And uh, we could actually look at performance of different options for the shortest factoring algorithm as quantum circuits. And so we built a CAD tool to do that. So um, I, I don't know, I think it's a pretty interesting area right now and there's a lot of interest in it. All right. So. Um, Sorry, I kept you guys way over, but this is the last lecture. I figured if anybody was interested, um, we talked about key value stores. We talked about cord. Um, hopefully I gave you an idea about cord because cord is the root from which pretty much all the interesting peer-to-peer -peer algorithms come and it's used in a, in a lot of areas right now. Um, we talked about, uh, briefly went through some cryptography and then I talked about how data capsules are all about the data and that's a new model. Um, uh, where the data can float to the edge and in, in the cloud and back. And um, I think it's, it's a pretty exciting project we got working on it, if anybody's interested in that. And then we told you a little bit about quantum computing and uh, feel free to come ask me or uh, also look at 151 or 191, excuse me, um, which is an interesting class in quantum computing. All right, well, thank you everybody. Sorry for going way over today. Thank you for those of you that stuck around. And uh, I hope you have a good uh, finalizing of project three. And uh, you've, those of you um, listening in cyberspace later as well, um, you are all great. And so um, I'm gonna miss you guys and I hope you have a wonderful holiday.
Have a uh, good rest of your semester, and I hope you don't have too many finals uh, in a week. Bye now.